Okay, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, this is Mohammad Anwar Shadat, uh, uh, an assistant professor in the department of Tripoli, BUVT. Uh, I'm really happy that students of BUVT are arranging different types of webinars and workshops during this pandemic situation. Uh, I'm, uh, I really would like to thank all of the participants and also today's guest speakers, uh, Professor Shakshi Dhanagar, uh, for uh, attending today's webinar. Uh, at the beginning, of, uh, although uh, the presenter has already introduced uh, uh, Professor Shakshi Dhanagar, uh, so I uh, have uh, nothing else to say. Uh, so finally, I would like to again welcome uh, uh, to our uh, uh, Professor Shakshi Dhanakar and uh, I would like to request her to continue her session. Thank you so much. Th thanks to all. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. And thank you, Nusrat, for the very nice introduction. Also, thanks to Tabil for inviting me for this webinar. So I'll share the screen. So um, I have already been introduced. Currently, I am working uh, as assistant professor at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur. I don't know how many of you have visited uh, this part of India. Uh, so I am located in, um, in the western part of the country. So in case you happen to come here sometime, please um, feel free to let me know. So we'll be happy to receive you here. Um, so uh, my presentation is on MEMS and microfluidics for bio applications. I understood from Tabil that there will be students from CSC and uh, EEE background. So this kind of presentation is more application oriented. So in case you have any doubt, you can um, ask in between. If not, you can put it in the chat box and we can have Q&A later. Uh, my presentation would be more, um, okay, there's something, is there anything for me? I don't know. Okay, uh, so um, this kind of presentation is mainly to do with uh, device development. So when we are talking about MEMS and microfluidics, uh, we mainly talk about uh, how they are made um, how they operate, right? And for bio applications. So I will cover each aspect. Uh, however, it might not be possible to cover everything in detail in this short time. So, okay, so this is the outline of the presentation. So I'll start with the most important aspect as to what is microfabrication, then why silicon, what are these biosensors and biochips, and then coming on to MEMS and microfluidics then processes to make them. We'll see how much we can cover up this part today. And I'll end up with uh, showing you a microfluidic chip that I developed in IIT Delhi when I was working there. OK, so coming on to what is microfabrication, right? We are talking about building devices on silicon wafer. So this is how, just for information, how a silicon wafer looks like, right? So all your. Uh, computer ICs that you see on the back panel, right, or on your Intel processor. And there you have those transistors and diodes and switches. All those are made on silicon wafer. So silicon processing is one of the traditional processing, and people have been using it for years. The good part about it is that even today, uh, this is being used as a standard process. Well, there is a lot of research happening uh, in the advanced areas, if we can replace silicon, if we can have something which is non-conventional, can we move on to flexible electronics? And they have their own importance for sure. But then uh, with each material, there are some challenges and there are some advantages, right? So in this duration of the presentation, we will mainly talk about working on silicon wafer, right? So if you uh, see it's the best part about microfabrication is the processes are standardized, right? Uh, it is very important for, uh, for an engineer or for a researcher to know what process to do on the substrate to get what, right? So I'll show you in the next slides what I mean when I say this. So uh, this chip that you see at the top, sorry, 
now. Just give me a second. Yeah. So this chip that you see, here you can see some circles and you can see some gold lines, right? And then you can see some silver color as well. So these are all micro patterns, which means that they are, these are all in the range of few microns, right? It can be few hundreds, it can be few eight hundreds micron, right? So when we are talking about uh, mainly classical MEMS, which is micro electromechanical system, right? I will talk about this also in detail, but when we are classifying our MEMS devices, right, we are mainly talking about the, the dimensions. So when I say it's one to 300 micron, right, lateral dimensions, we are talking about classical time. And when it's 300 micron to 3 mm, this is still called MEMS, even though you have reached 3000 micron. And when we talk about 10 nanometer to one micron is where now we are touching nano. Right? So it has some overlap with MEMS because it's starting with one micron, but slowly it's touching towards nano electromechanical systems. Right? So um, why silicon is important is somewhat I have discussed. Uh, the best thing about silicon material is that it is very easily available in the sense that it's available in the form of um, sand, right? And we can process it to get disks like these and then each disk we can use to make thousands of devices right you can very easily uh, modify the surface this is very important that how we can easily modify the surface mainly because silicon is known to be available in the form of silicon dioxide silicon dioxide is supposed to be very stable right so any reaction with sio2 if it is known you can easily modify that surface to whatever terminal groups you want. Suppose for an application, you need hydrophilic property and for another application, you need hydrophobic property. So you can process the top surface of silicon material so you can use it for a specific application, right? The processing is somewhat very much known. And now we say it's cheap because you can make thousands of devices in one go. Right? So it's not that I'm making two transistor on say two big silicon wafers, right? We are making millions of it on two. So that way the processing becomes very cheap. And then we also know, I'm sure we all have learned about PNP transist transistors, right? Or, or diodes. So it's very uh, much known as to how we can diffuse N and diffuse P right, make intrinsic silicon to extrinsic silicon, right? Then um, these silicon wafers are durable and stable, right? And they are also available in single crystal form, which you will eventually learn if you actually work into device development. Why do we need single crystal form, right? Or why do we need polysilicon? What special properties it has? Basically, this only means that Silicon is abundantly available and one can process it and make it in a used form, right? And microelectronics and MEMS cannot be done without silicon, no matter how far the technology has come up to, but uh, there is still a lot of advantage of using silicon in both of these applications. So this is just a picture of uh, how a Zokralski method is. I'm sure you can find it in uh, different web pages or books, mainly your silicon, which is in the form of sand, right? That is processed to make it into a form of this ingot, right? And then we cut these into disks. And when you cut these, you actually get something like this, right? And on this, you process your uh, devices. So this is more about silicon basics, which I think I can skip. This is important in the sense that um, whenever you want to make a device, right? Suppose uh, nowadays bipolar is not much used, but if I talk about MOS, right? MOSFET. So I have to know which substrate to use. If I'm making NMOS, I need a P substrate. Now somebody gives me four kinds of wafer and says, okay, identify what you want. 
So the good part is that there are some standard cuts which are there on the wafer, which helps us identify the orientation and the type of silicon. Right. So whether I want it, it may not be possible for one to identify only one thing. Right. It gives two information. So if I need N type 100, it should have two cuts. These are called as flats. Right. So they stay as a um, as a way to recognize which wafer is what type and which orientation. Right. And when the flats are at 90 degree, it is P type 100. Right. So if you see both are 100, the orientation is the same, but the type is different. Right. This orientation and type carries a lot of importance in microelectronics or I should say microfabrication processes. Right. So they become very, very important in the sense that one should know which orientation and which type you're working on if you plan to go for microfabrication processes. Right. OK, so coming on to biosensors and biochips and we hear a lot about it nowadays, mainly because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, there are still researchers who are trying to figure out if there can be a device which one can just have it at home and help you know whether the person is COVID positive or not. Otherwise, we are just dependent on the RT-PCR test, right? And we have seen a scenario two months back when even getting that test done was a big problem. So uh, what really are biosensors, right? So as the name says, it's bio. So something that is for bio application and sensors. Sensors are devices where you have uh, the, there is a change in property of these devices when they're exposed to analytes. By analytes, I mean, say a virus, uh, a, a virus, um, interacts with a material and that material shows a different say a voltage or a current or a resistance is where you say that this device is working as a biosensor right and then what are biochips biochips are mainly platforms which comprise of a sensor and also electronic circuitry right so biochip is more complete in a sense, and biosensor is mainly the device which is showing you a change, right? So what do we have? We have a sample. The sample can be anything. It can be water, food, air, right? It can be body fluids, right? And then there is some kind of processing and separation that one has to do, depending on what you want to see. Suppose I want to see bacteria in water, right? And I have, uh, say, a big beaker and I have kept, uh, say, 5 ml of water. And my bacteria level is some very small x CFU per ml. So it might be difficult to detect this x from 5 ml. So can I take like 10 microliter out of it? Right? So then you can have some channels or some ways by which you only allow small quantity to detect this XCFU per ml, right? And then you do the detection mechanism. So now comes capturing of this bacteria, right? Is where you use a sensing mechanism and then comes data analysis. How much of X is present? Is it low or is it high, right? Can, it, can the data be transferred through a phone or can it just go, uh, um, say, on as a, as a readout in the in the equipment itself right like you have these uh, bloods uh, blood uh, sugar monitoring devices right nowadays we can check uh, blood sugar just at home so there you get the readout and it tells you the value but what if this can be transferred through antennas uh, say to my phone right so this is something that in today's time people are working on where they are trying to improve the detection techniques. They are trying to improve uh, the sending of data, right? Okay, so biochips for detection. So what are the key applications? We know it's medicine, pharmaceuticals, food, water quality, and many more, 
right? And what is very important for these biochips that they should be sensitive, right? It cannot give you a wrong answer, right? Somebody supposes testing for COVID and the machine says that you're positive, but you're actually not, right? That should not happen. No false positives, no false negatives as well. So they have to be really accurate, right? And then they have to be rapid. It should not happen that today I give sample say to a device at home and tomorrow it gives me the results so it has to be really quick maximum five minutes right and then it should be affordable it should not become so expensive that a common man cannot uh, afford it right so there are lots of companies which are actually into uh, development of biochips some i have named and there are many more now especially after the pandemic there are a lot more companies Right. So this is how if you see a lab on a chip is made. So this is like a, a PDMS and you have holes in it and then you also have uh, capillaries and they are going around it. So you can collect your sample from here or you can um, sorry, collect it from here or here, right, depending on what your application is. I'll also show you one chip that I worked on. So these are uh, some um, this is just an integrated system, right? Where it's talking about uh, microorganisms and cells and what are the techniques used if you have to separate really small microorganisms to big ones, right? Well, if you're working on, say, bigger microorganisms like bacteria, filtering becomes very easy. But say if you're working on virus, then filtering may not work like it worked for bacteria because the size of the molecules are small. So what do we do in this case is that uh, we use different techniques. Like this is one method, dielectrophoresis, where uh, there is some kind of concentration sorting. So if you can have, uh, say, the concentrated ones at one side, right? Nowadays, people also use some magnetic probes. So they use some iron nanoparticles, right? And you have these uh, magnetic materials which help in separation of these microorganisms from the lot. Right? Antibody antigen based are very common. I'm not sure how many of you have heard it, um, but this um, it's it's not very specific, but uh, our current RT-PCR test is based on antibody antigen test because it's the best that we can use right now. So it's not, it depends on case to case where it can become non-specific also, but generally antibody antigen are very common tests, right? And then comes your impedance spectroscopy, which is also a very well-known technique in the area of biosensors. Right? Then we have nanoprobe arrays where you have cells and you can do lysing of the cells using these small probes. Right? You can apply electric field and separate them. And then you have these cantilevers and nano FETs, nanoprobes that also people use for mechanical electrical detection. Right, so this is still, I would say, if you are like uh, BSc Triple E or BSc CSE, this might be a little early stage for you to grasp all of it. But uh, it will be good if you can just understand what exactly is a biosensor and what are the ways by which it can be detected. Right, I'll show you some uh, pictures of cantilevers. Probably that will help you to understand it better. So coming on to MEMS, right? MEMS is microelectro mechanical systems. So what exactly does it mean? So here in the picture, you can see that there is a cantilever. This is like a bent form. It is curvy. You can see its shadow here, right? So this can act like a switch. Switch in the sense when this cantilever will bend down, right? It will allow the signal to flow from here to here. Right, And when it is up, it is like an open switch. So it will not allow any signal to pass through. Now, this is made in silicon. So you can imagine this is uh, curvy already, right? Which, is, which means that it is already bent structure. And then to put it down and pull it up using some electrical force, right? The chances of breaking are very high. That's why... Working in the field of MEMS require expertise in software, and then it requires immense experience in, in experimental field, right? 
there's a, there are a lot of processes that you have to follow to make one MEMS device. Right? So when we say combination of mechanical elect electrical components, which means that if you apply any um, mechanical force, right, there can be a transfer of signal. So this becomes electrical. Or if you apply some signal, it moves. So it's either electrical to mechanical or mechanical to electrical. Right? So here we say that some mechanical functions like sensing, moving, heating, and electrical functions would be switching or voltage on the same chip is what is MEMS. You can see these tiny sensors. These are all MEMS-based sensors. Some names are very much known, like pressure sensor, accelerometers, gyroscopes, right? You have gyroscopes and accelerometers in your uh, car, right? OK, so what is the accepted size range for MEMS? This I have broadly discussed in the beginning, so I'm skipping this slide. OK, coming on to BioMEMS, right? What are BioMEMS? So these are biomedical and biological applications of MEMS, right? So mainly we have a bigger circle with some overlap. So BioMEMS is uh, that encompasses your micro needles right your implantable electrodes organ on chip right you might have heard of i'm not sure how many of you have but now um, there are some some patches available that you can put on yourself and um, you have so that uh, that has a needle right that you will not even know when it picks up a really small sample of your blood right checks the sugar level and if the sugar level is more than a threshold, an insulin will be given to you, right? So that injection of insulin can be by the person uh, himself or herself, or uh, it can be even automated. But the very important thing is that that patch is now available that you can just wear on yourself, right? That is MEMS. It's a wearable MEMS device, yeah? So point of care diagnostic chips is uh, the, the example of that patch is for point of care diagnostic chips, right? Mini HRIs biosensor also falls in the same category, right? So there are actually a lot of applications of MEMS. If you see BioMEMS is just one part of it, but in BioMEMS itself, there are a lot of applications. Okay, so coming on to the important aspects of fabrication of biomems, right? The most important thing some comes is what material to choose. Like silicon we discussed in the beginning, right? Which I said is a conventional substrate and a lot of people are still working on silicon. But now there are advanced materials in the family of polymers, right? So there are lots of polymers, this one PDMS, very much known, PMMA is known, Teflon is known, right? So these are some materials which fall in the uh, category of polymers. And uh, these are also used as materials for making MEMS or BioMEMS devices, right? Few others are glass, quads, right? And also biological entities. Now, depending on which substrate you start, so which material you use, you have to choose your fabrication process. How will you use it, right? What will you build on it to make it into a MEMS device? So there are wet processes, sol gel, there are wet agents, there are dry processes like sputtering, RI, and many more. There is more of, say, your LP uh, VD techniques, right? Uh, PVD techniques, sorry. So then comes surface chemistry. Right. So suppose I make a device where I want to uh, have my uh, this strip, uh, which takes the blood sample. Same for your uh, glucose monitoring. Right now, the blood drop goes on it. But how does it react on the chip to give you a signal? Right. So if it has to give you a signal, it has to detect. Right. How will it detect with the help of? bonds on the surface right so this is like your antibody antigen capture also just an example 
So you have antibodies attached on the material and the antigen comes and gets fitted into it and then you see, sorry, and then you see a change in um, current or you see a change in wavelength or you see change in force, pressure, right? Then what is the nature of bioanalyte? This is very important. So I am uh, wanting to say detect glucose, right? So I have to have the understanding of how glucose will react to my chip, right? What are the other properties it has? Will it be sitting on a surface which is water loving or not water loving, right? And then comes a very important property of robustness, right? How robust is your device? So I keep it in a city which is 40 degree centigrade and then suddenly I move to a snowy area where the temperature is say zero degree. Will my sensor behave the same as it was at 40? Is something that one has to think about, right? If the place is windy, dusty, what will happen? So how robust is your sensor is an important thing to think about. And then what are the conditions for testing environment? Like I said, how humid it is, how um, how hot it is, how cold it is. All these actually mainly fall into your field tests, right? So people who have worked in the area of sensors uh, might understand this, that when you work on a sensor in a lab, it behaves totally different than how it behaves on the field, right? There the, dy the entire dynamics get changed, yeah? Okay, so how is cantilever a biosensor? So this is a, a picture of, say, a silicon wafer. And this is where the hanging structure is, which you're seeing as moving. Right now, let's see how it behaves like a biosensor. So I have a cantilever, right? So when you say cantilever, it's it's a structure which is which can move up and down, right? So uh, now, how will it uh, behave like a sensor? So what we do, we introduce this cantilever to different bioanalytes. And then the beam moves up and down, right? And then we say it's behaving like a cantilever. Now, cantilever can also move if you have put a heavy weight um, object, right? And it might break as well. So it is important to know that if it is specifically working as a biosensor, that we'll see how we can do. So suppose this is a cantilever, right? And here I have my chrome gold, which is mainly your contact pad. Yeah, from where you take your signal. Now we put some receptor molecules, which are our antibodies, and we allow antigens. So suppose we put antibodies of COVID uh, antigen and then allow the antigen to fall on. Now, these pink circles will fit very well in the green ones. That's how antibody antigen are, right? They are lock-in key mechanism. So once they sit on this, this will have more weight and then will move down. And as you remove these pink circles again, it should go back up to its reference position, right? So how much it moved from its reference position, which is here, right, from this X, to X1 is we know how much sensitive it is, right? How much it moved with respect to the same position is your sensor response. Now, suppose uh, I I put here some other antigen, say typhoid antigen, but these antibodies are for COVID, right? So suppose they are square in shape and they are this big. Now, when they go, they don't fit in. So they don't get locked with the antibody. And so what happens, this will not move from X to X1, maybe till X dash if needed. So that way we can say that these are some other molecules which are not binding with the antibody. And so it is not a sensor for typhoid, rather for COVID. Yeah. So this is what, uh, is what I said is summarized here, that we have uh, our green ones, which will attach very well to the blue ones, right? And the green ones do not get attached to the yellow ones. So what happens at this 
cantilever stays as such and this one bends because they have got attached so this is working as a sensor and this is not working as a sensor right okay this is a lot of theory so i think we can skip coming on to microfluidics and why it is important so um, microfluidics is mainly yeah is there anything for me in the chat box you can let me know because i'm sharing my screen so okay sorry to okay. ma'am there was a question that someone asked in the chat box that is it possible to develop a memes device that is pre-coded to detect any change of any fluids possible to develop is it Take there will be an answer question session after the end of yes, this. Yes, we can take them. Yeah, yeah good we can take them. Okay. Sure, Sorry. sure. Okay. okay, so um, what happens exactly in microfluidic devices, right? In MEMS, we were talking about some moving structures that we have cantilevers and they bend or they move when they have, uh, say, antigens coming and falling on them. In microfluidics, we talk about these channels, right? Fluidic channels, which are uh, used to allow the fluids to pass through so it can be gas sorry it can be gas or it can be liquid right first let's understand why they are important right so suppose i'm working in a field where i am um, um, say i'm working in in the field of medicine suppose right so i'm uh, especially making drugs right say for covid i'm developing a drug if somebody gets COVID, they can just take this medicine and be all right. Now, these medicines which are made, they are extremely expensive. The raw material is extremely expensive. So I can't afford to use 50 ml of a solution for trying to see if it is working like a medicine or not, right? I might just use 5 microliter. Now, 5 microliter is really tiny. If I put it in a beaker, what will happen? You will see a dot here. Right, and nothing gets retained, it will evaporate or something will happen or it will stick to the body of the beaker. Now here comes the role of these microfluidic channels. I can allow 5 microliter to pass through the microfluidic channel. I'll make it very narrow, instead of making a wide pipe, we'll make it a thin one, right? And wherever I need to connect it, I will use. So the, this you can see, this is like a microfluidic channel. I put it at one port and then I make it go wherever so these are the patterns that you can make according to your application what you are working on it can even be as simple as one input port one more input port and one output port right and i have say liquid coming from here liquid coming from here they both meet and then they go down and meet here now by making these serpentine channels or by uh, making this straight channel i'm also achieving something else and what is that? That is, one, I'm using very small quantity of liquid. So I save on my uh, antibodies or the raw materials for making, uh, say, a medicine, right? The other thing that I'm doing is I'm allowing liquid one and liquid two to come meet, mix, mix for a long time, and then I take an output, right? So that means I'm allowing it more time. Right. So when you mix two things, right, say you mix sugar and water, right, if the water is at normal temperature, what do you do? You have to do more stirring. If you heat it up, it quickly melts. Right. That means you have to do stirring for almost 20, 25 times to make that sugar get more soluble in the water. This is exactly similar. So you have one liquid, you have another liquid and you want it to be mixed for a long time so that you get efficient output. All this is possible right with microfluidics so there were some problems with the traditional instruments one i have discussed that uh, there are a lot of volumes which are required if you go with traditional instruments you need more volume of raw materials which you can make it uh, less in use by using microfluidics right and then the complexity right there are lots of genes and there are so many proteins in the human body. If I have to even work on one tenth of it, I can't do it if I use uh, big uh, instruments or big instruments, I mean big volume instruments. 
it's better to use uh, microfluidic channels, right? Where I can allow these proteins to pass through, I get mixed up, do a reaction, and then I take the output, right? So these are some of the problems with the traditional instruments, and that is why people came up with something called as microfluidics. But if you see, in general, microfluidics is not uh, that old a system, right? All our veins and arteries that we have are kind of microfluidics, right? We don't take liquid so that some reaction happens, right? But then uh, the pattern is the same. This is what we have learned from nature, right? So microfluidics, that phase is not new. So coming on to uh, why this is called as quantitative biology, is mainly because of the fact that we can make small fluidics, small volumes of fluidic pass through the channels, right? So if you see, this is like an eight channel. So this is made in PDMS, right? These are all made in PDMS channels. So these are 16 channels, 64 channels, depending on what you want to work on, whether you're working on blood sample, you're working on urine sample, you're working on saliva, or you're doing some other studies where you need some solvents to be stored or passed through, you can make, you can design your own channels, right? So yeah, this is one, one or I should say some two or three examples to show how microfluidics work. So if you see there is uh, this liquid being passed on here, right? And then it goes to different fingers, right? So suppose this is my uh, say medicine that I have made. I want to see if it can kill typhoid, uh, corona, malaria, uh, say something else, right, X, Y, Z. So what I will do, I will use this small uh, test medicine, put a drop here. It will go and interact with typhoid cells, corona cells, right, malaria cells, and you will get the output at each finger, whether the cell has been killed or not, right? If suppose this medicine kills typhoid, so this is successful for typhoid, but not for these. So at one time with one sample, I can do this simple test. Right, so this is one of the examples. Okay, so coming on to microfabrication processes for MEMS also, actually there are this a flower that you see looks much smaller. Otherwise there are uh, more techniques Right, so when I say deposition, there can be four more flowers. And if I say etching, there can be four more uh, flowers. So these are just names of some of the techniques that one can use for uh, development of uh, MEMS or microfluidic channel. Right, let me see if I have it. Okay, fine. So if I talk about silicon wafer and silicon uh, cleaning, right, if, if you have worked in a fab lab or if you have worked in a silicon lab, one would know that it's extremely important to have a clean surface, right? Extremely clean surface. And then sometimes you need uh, silicon dioxide on the surface. You know, a silicon dioxide acts like an insulator. You might have read it in your MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor, right? So we use thermal oxidation. We use diffusion. I explained in the beginning, uh, diffuse P or diffuse N into the substrate, right? We do lithography to make patterns on the surface. I'll show you some examples. Deposition is done to deposit different layers, right, on the surface, whether you want chrome, gold, you want zinc, zinc oxide, uh, whatever, whichever material you want, you can use deposition techniques, right? Etching means you want to remove something. So if you remember, I showed you when the cantilever is made, right, this sits on a base. So from here, every the material is etched out, right? So that you get this hanging structure. It's done using etching. And this uh, fusion and anodic bonding is mainly to do with your packaging, which is extremely, extremely important in both MEMS and microfluidics, right? I'll show you. <clears throat> so uh, this is a picture to show you how the cantilever is actually made. So uh, this is my silicon substrate, right? These have different layers. I'll not get into the details, otherwise this won't end at all. But if you see, one thing is that this cantilever, right, is sitting on silicon wafer. Now, if you carefully see, they etched from the back, 
right? So this got removed. Now this became empty. And then they removed the green layer also. And now this can go up and down depending on for whichever function you're using it for, right? What is happening in this case is, if you see, they have not removed the green one, right? Here, the gray one is the substrate. So they actually etch out the substrate from the back. This is called as a bulk micro machining. And here, the surface at the top of the substrate gets etched out. So if you see here, they have put white, then the black, and then they removed this white and this white both, right? And you're left with only black, and now this behaves like a cantilever. That's why this is called as surface micro machining. Here you remove the bulk and becomes bulk micro machining. Here you remove from the surface, it becomes surface micro machining. In both, you're getting a cantilever only. The way it is made is totally different. Right? So I'll take you through some of the chips that we made. So here we started with silicon wafer. If I'll not get into details. Let me just show you what we made. OK. So this is what you'll see. This is a silicon wafer, right? Two inch in diameter. This is port number one. This is port number two. So it has been etched out. So this is like a reservoir, right? So this is, say, your point number one. This is your input number two. You put one liquid from here, put one liquid from here, or gas, whatever you want to mix. It comes down and then follows this path. Right, it goes zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. You can see the width is here is different, width here is different. And this is my output. So my third number port, I when I take it out and test it, I will know what is the mixed response of one and two. Right, so this has been made using etching in silicon. Right, now if you see this picture, this one, you can see some kind of glass at the top. This is called as corning glass. Now, this is where it is used for packaging. So silicon wafer and glass, they are bonded together under high voltage and high temperature. And then they stick with it with each other forever. This is uh, not a separable bond, right? And what happens, uh, if you remember here, I said that we have etched silicon. So if I put a drop of liquid, some will travel, some might fall out. So what should I do? I should put a cap on the top. This is exactly the, that we did here. We have put a cap. Now liquid one goes here, liquid two goes here. Inside they are getting mixed. And at three, we take the output. Right? So nothing gets spilled out. Oops. My pen is though. <laughs> OK leave the pen, right? So this is what it shows a package device. This is a polycarbonate ho housing. This is your one, and this is your two, and this is your three. This is a complete package device. Here you have silicon, you have glass on top, and then everything sits together in the polycarbonate, right? OK, so these are the microscope pictures of our channel. So you can see. These are 400 micron wide, and these are 600 micron wide. And the shadow that you see are the walls of silicon. Yeah, how deep it is, is these are 143, these are 186, right? A silicon wafer two inch diameter is around 280 micron deep, uh, sorry, thick. Okay, so these are more details about how we calculate if the flow is laminar or it is turbulent. There is a formula by which we find out. So I'm not getting into details of this. OK, so this is another. This is not my my work. This is taken from uh, this paper, Rapid Detection of Bacterial Resistance to Antibiotics Using AFM Cantilevers as Nanomechanical Sensors. So this is very similar to uh, the example I showed you in the Previous slide said there is a cantilever, right? And here they are checking the bacterial resistance to antibiotics, right? So I have different antibiotics, and I have a platform here which will react to these antibiotics, right? 
and once you place these antibiotics depending on if the green reacts with uh, sorry the blue reacts with green or the green reacts with green or this light red reacts with green this cantilever will move and depending on how much it deflects the signal is picked up by say an optical detector right so this is just a graphical abstract to show that how these this is nanomechanical so this is not really mems this comes into under nems right how they move how they deflect and their deflection is actually calculated to see if this reaction is happening or not or if it is working as a biosensor or not yeah so yeah this is another work uh, this is also taken from uh, a paper this paper so i'm not getting into details of this but this is uh, the same thing that they have shown previously that how the see the thing with these uh, cantilevers and these mems devices is when they are vibrating or when they are bending right that bending is very very small so you need a sophisticated facility to see how much they are bending you can't see by your naked eye and say okay it has bent by 3 cm it will just happen in few microns right so how much it is vibrating how much it is bending you need to have that facility but once you have it then it's very um, i mean if you have a good fab lab and you have a good characterization lab then these are one of the very sensitive devices which can be explored in the area of biomems yeah so these are some ways that you can connect to us i also do some activities in ieee so already i was introduced that i am the yp chair for the sensor council so we do a lot of activities through that plus uh, we started with a chapter uh, sensors chapter at rajasthan and delhi so in case you want to connect to me or you want to connect to my group or if you have any doubts and you want to get back to me please feel free to send an email yeah i'm happy to take questions thank you ma'am for your amazing presentation we are impressed having a great seminar i think the participants learned a lot today at this moment we will go ahead for the questions we got uh, ma'am we have some questions in our chat box uh, should i tell you or you just um no i can see it let me go through them okay. is it possible to develop a mems device uh, that is pre coded to detect any okay so i think what mohammad hafiz is asking is that if there is like a, a coated kind of device so the, i just and say i want to detect bacteria am i correct uh yes ma'am i i was uh, actually uh, want to thank you for this wonderful session and uh, my question was actually uh, if we can collaborate the computer vision uh, like artificial intelligence in uh, mms uh, m e m s actually mm -hmm. uh okay so if we say that uh, we want to get into ai with mems then in that case you need the data to be generated by mems already right and then you will do some kind of training on on that data if i'm correct uh yeah the data set can be uh, trained uh, supervised or unsupervised but uh, my question was uh, if we can uh, uh, you know uh, interpret some devices with this name in uh, nano or micrometers so that we can uh, you know use the microfluids or use uh, the uh, hydrophobic uh, properties of this uh, uh, devices right so uh, if i have to answer your question that if we can get a pre coded mems device so the answer is uh, uh, no in the sense that if i want to use a device say for bio mems right and i suppose i get a device which has some coating and it can detect bacteria right so you expose it to bacteria uh, in water but how much it has bent you may not know because you are holding it or you have just kept it that's why i said that you need a, a a more sophisticated facility where you can have an equipment you keep that cantilever then you do your experiments with bacteria and that will tell you how many microns it has moved 
Uh, so it will get most costlier than the usual ones. <laughs> so that's why if the facility is set, then working on MIMS is it's actually only possible if you have facilities. Otherwise, it may not work. But working in microfluidics is still possible if you don't have fab facilities. Like instead of making channels in silicon, you can make channels in PDMS. So there are polymers, like the pictures that I have shown, the transparent ones, that you can do even if you are not into, say, hardcore fab. So that's possible. Yeah. 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 But all your cars have these accelerometers and gyroscopes. Your phone has gyroscopes. So ultimately, they are being made uh, with standard facilities. But of course, you need that to build on it. Yeah. And AI, yeah, you can anytime apply. Once you have the data, then AI can be used for any data. Yeah, I know that. But I, I was thinking about that particular portion, if we can pre-code it, actually. Yeah, thank yeah. you, ma'am. Thank you. I got my answer. So what else? Um... Any other question from the audience? Yeah, there is some question in chat box. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Devashish Shaho, uh, Mr. Devashish Shaho, uh, he is a PhD scholar. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps he, he has asked a question that can we use the these mechanism in detection of chemical compound responsible for drug activity from a mixture of compound in a herbal drug formulation? The last question in the chat box you also yes yes detection of chemical compound responsible for drug activity from a mixture of compound in a herbal uh yes Debashish, you can use if i understand correctly you're talking about detection of one uh chemical say which is responsible for any uh, drug activity and it is in a mixture right so if it is in a mixture and you want to detect one chemical for that can be done using uh, MEMS devices. Yeah, it depends on which chemical you want to detect. And you put the complementary part on the MEMS device so that interaction happens. So then you will again, it's lock and key. So that is very much possible. Uh, so uh, I hope Mr. Devasis Shao has got his answer. So anyone else from the audience? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So anyone else from the audience, uh, if you want to know any question, you may ask. Ma'am, last question, Mr. Hafiz Shikdar. What if we work on a very specific one? Uh, so if you work, yeah. I think if you work on a specific protein, then you can move into DNA and you can move into you know building aptamers. You don't have to be uh, specifically beyond antigen and antibody. So mainly it's the binding that you want to make. If you want this specific protein to bind uh, to a complementary target, then you can always work in uh, the DNA part. So there you can have your complementary DNA strand and only that ways they will bind. So instead of antibody antigen, you can move to DNA. Thank you, ma'am. OK, thank you, ma'am. So any other question? So in the meantime, may, uh, I have a question, ma'am, uh, yes. from myself, Mr. Mushadat. Actually, I'm all, also working on. There is a lot um, of question, I think. Okay, uh, if there is a great speaker, indeed. Okay, okay, if there are any other question you may ask, I may ask my question uh, at the end of the se uh, session. Okay, if it is not, then um, I'm, I'm asking my question that I'm wondering that uh, what fabrication technology uh, are really available in India. Because here in Bangladesh, you know, uh, we researchers who are working on nanotechnology or photonics, uh, we are uh, simulating some uh, fibers and like nanofiber in micrometer or nanometer scale. So mm -hmm. uh, we just uh, simulate uh, the file and we just uh, publish our research on simulation basis, you know. So if you want to fabricate any uh, uh, dye or any types of fiber uh, which are in that scale, so where can we actually fabricate them? Is there any facility in India uh, in any uh, institute? So if you talk about microfabrication facility that you can get all under one roof, there are two main places. One is IISC Bangalore, which is Indian Institute of Science. They have a, a, a open facility for public. Uh, however, you have to book first and then take a slot. But there you can do it. The other option is IIT Bombay. They also have complete fab 
available. Uh, third option is IIT Delhi. They also have fab facilities, but it depends on uh, which specific equipment you are looking at. So if it is uh, general equipment, they have all, I mean, everything set in. Uh, if you're looking at some specific facility, then IIT Delhi, uh, you'll have to explore it through the website. And uh, interestingly, IIT Jodhpur is also going to come up with clean room, but it will take uh, at least a year for things to uh, get started. But once we have it, then we can always invite you here. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, uh, is the uh, Indian government is funding uh, on these labs or the institution itself is funding? It's the government funding. They are all funded by the government. OK, yeah, I just know that uh, they are very expensive, actually. Uh, so they are, they are expensive. expensive, yes. So th there can always be ways by which you can uh, say build something and then get the revenue generated uh, through the facility itself. Oh, OK, OK. So if I take any slot, then uh, do I have to work uh, myself or they will give us uh, any other person that which uh, who will help us or instruct us to mm -hmm. do our the First thing I think anybody would want to know is which facility. So the best thing about all these fiber, is, like polymer based fiber. Uh, yes, but say you want to uh, um, say build that, right? So you want to use a polymer, say a sheet, because I don't work in fiber, so I'm asking. So in that case, suppose you use some uh, some etching or some kind of rolling, or do you use that when you're working in fibers? Yes, I, I have used actually uh, uh, solid slots inside the fiber. Okay. So okay. A year holes, so uh, you know, asymmetrical type uh, year holes. So uh, right. it's, it's difficult actually. Uh, some, uh, asymmetrical types of any design is uh, easy to fabricate, but I know asymmetrical is very tough. So uh, mm -hmm. this facility is not available in all the labs. That is why I was asking that is there any facility okay. available for these types of fibers or uh, these types of elements in India? Right, right. So also what you can do is that one, you can write to me and I can uh, find out here on your behalf. The other option is that uh, IISC Bangalore, IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, all three of them have uh, their websites where they have mentioned about the facilities they have, their capabilities. So once you are sure that these are, say, three specific techniques you want to use, uh, they have an email and you write to them and they'll give you all details because they would have a lot of questions. What diameter, what length, what is the design? Uh, then will be the question as to who will come or we will do or we will send. Right? First, they would yeah, want their answers. Once that is done, then uh, they'll find a way out. So Because we also rely on ISC Bangalore many times. In your lecture, you uh, mentioned about soul gel. That is why I was asking, because this is one of the fabrication process of such fibers. So that is why I asked that, is there any other facility? OK, I'm done with my question. If any, thank you, ma'am. Uh, is any uh, one uh, wants to any other question, then you can email ask. Uh, I think uh, there is no more question. So we can end our question session at this moment. I would like to ask Poshanjit Roy, Chair of IEEE Sensor Council BUBT SB Chapter, to express his perception about today's event. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thanks, Shakshi Danegar, ma'am, for describing the, the topic such a wonderful way. Hope everyone enjoy it. We are willing to do of this type of event in future. And thanks to all, uh, help us to make a great session. Start with the IEEE PUVT student branch. Thank you. I think that's the end of the session, ma'am. And thank you again on behalf of IEEE family and on behalf of PUVT uh, for uh, uh, giving lecture on today's topic. I thank you all. Inshallah, in the latter, if uh, any uh, student or any other organization, if you if they want to organize such web media, then definitely we will. I would like to knock you again. Sure, sure. And if any student or if you want to contact any time, please feel free to send an email. Okay. So yes. Thank you all. So, Kavi or any other student, if you have any... Uh, any sir, questions. for two minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir and ma'am, just only two minutes. Uh, we have a present for you, actually. 
ma'am it's a crest of appreciation hope you like it <laughs> thank you so much i wish i was there to receive it <laughs> this is yeah, lovely <laughs> We are really grateful, ma'am, uh, uh, to have you here, and you just uh, give us our your uh, insightful, actually, lecture. So thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Angar. Thank you, ma'am. So I think that's that's it. Okay. Uh, so Tabil, we can just uh, close close the session, right? Uh, thank you once again to all the honorable guests, faculty members, and the students for your cooperation. That is the must of for all time. It's been a pleasure with uh, all of you today. And again, thanks your for your patience. Thank you.